Fine. Welcome. Glad you're here. Brad just said it. Uh, I'll repeat it. Pastor Barry and Rosemary will be back next Sunday. So you have that to look forward to. We hope to see you right back here next week. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you don't know me, uh, pleasure to meet you. I'll meet you out there afterwards. We'll say hi. Um, I'm excited I get to share the Word of God with you all this morning. Uh, I want to share just a little bit about how we're going to attack this piece of text this morning. Um, now, I'm a big fan of character studies. I'm a big fan of uh, historical biographies. Uh, when you think about that, think Winston Churchill, think Abraham Lincoln, uh, George Washington, C.S. Lewis. So as you look into the histories of people that have come before us, I get really involved and, and I really enjoy reading about it because when we look at biographies and when we look at character studies in particular, what we see is a picture of a person with some of the same flaws that we have, some of the same successes that we have. We see a lot of traits and personalities that allow us to understand ourselves a little bit better. Now, one of the really amazing things about Scripture, about the Bible, is this, is that God gave us His Word in multiple different literary forms, okay? And what that means is we can look at it in one sense, there's narrative storytelling. In other parts, there's books of prophecy. Sometimes it's just historical documentation. Other times it's theological and basis. It's treatises. It's, a, it's seminary level theological discussions from the Apostle Paul. There's all sorts of literary genres that exist within the Bible. Now, like I said, as we look at character studies, uh, one of the things that we see in the Bible is this. Not only do we get to look at the characters and the stories in the Bible that God has given us to evaluate those individuals and possibly ourselves as well, it gives us an insight into the nature of God. It shows us His personality. It shows us His love and His mercy, His wrath, His justice. It shows us all these different facets about who God is. And at the same time, it gives us insight into who we are. Where do we mess up? How are we created? How are we uh, unique? And then at the same time, how are we similar to these characters that we read about in the Bible? Now, this morning, we're going to go through an entire book of the Bible with you this morning. How's that sound? Sound good? Yeah, some of you are like, please not Psalms, please not Psalms. Um, it's not Psalms. <laughs> uh, we're going to go through the book of Jonah. And if you've never read through the entire book of Jonah before, you can do it pretty quickly. There's not... It's not an extremely long book. It's a story. And most of you have probably heard the story as children. If not, you heard it as adults and you heard it told a specific way. But today we're going to look through this uh, from a position of narrative storytelling. God told us a story about one of his people. And why did he tell us the story? We're going to look through this. Jonah is a, is a book of the Bible that I strongly relate to. And it's probably for that reason that I tend to want to stay away from Jonah. I don't necessarily love reading the book of Jonah, not that I don't love God's Word, but it points out things in me and things that have happened in my past that I said, man, I really wish I would have figured that out sooner. I wish I would have understood this about myself a little bit earlier. And so when I read it, it's exactly what I hope a historical biography should be. It's exactly what I hope an evaluation should be, is that I look at this and I see, okay, uh, it's helpful in examining myself to help me to grow. And that's exactly what the book of Jonah is. It's very helpful in examining our hearts. Now, there's a stark contrast in this book that reveals the heart of God and the heart of Jonah. They're two separate things. Sometimes they're in line. Sometimes they're out of sync. More often than not, we read about Jonah's heart not being in line with God's heart. And I would argue sometimes we find ourselves in very similar positions to Jonah. Now, some of you are like, well, I'm not an Old Testament prophet, so I don't know how I'm going to relate to Jonah. Trust me. There will be things here that you hear in God's Word that cause you to think, yeah, I think maybe I do that. Or yes, I think maybe I think that way sometimes. We can relate to Jonah. The book of Jonah, again, great tool to evaluate the condition of our hearts, not just towards God, but towards each other as well, and to help us to understand God's heart for us. Now, as part of what we do here, we stand for the reading of the main text this morning. I am not going to make you stand for the entire reading of the book of Jonah. So what I would ask you to do is we want to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak through the text to us this morning to honor God's Word above other things and to, to be able to give that honor where it's due. So would you please stand with me as we pray this morning? Father God, I thank you right now for this church family. Lord, I thank you for your Word. God, I, I thank you right now, Holy Spirit, that you make this Word come alive in our hearts. God, that you soften our hearts and you open our ears to the truth that you've given us in your Word. 
Lord, I ask right now, Lord, as we study your servant Jonah, God, that you would help us to examine ourselves. Holy Spirit, we invite you to encourage us. We invite you to convict us of areas in our heart that need to align more closely with you. God, we pray your blessing over this. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would wear me like a jacket and speak your, your truth and your word, Lord, not my opinion. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. You can have a seat, please. Now, today's message is called The Maelstrom, The Maneater, and The Mercy. Pastor Barry would be very proud. It's very good alliteration. All M's. <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Jonah this morning. We aren't going to touch every single verse, but we're going to hit some defining moments in the book. Okay? By the end of this reading and our conversation this morning, we need to have an understanding of what is being shown to us in order to ask ourselves a question that really we should be asking ourselves every time we open God's Word. What does God want me to do in response to what He's shown me? Here's some context for you this morning. You need to know context. Context is key because without context, we can kind of make parts of the Bible say things that they don't necessarily say. We need to understand the history. We need to understand the when, the where, the how, the who, the why. What's happening here that gives us insight into what's actually being taught? Why did God put this here? Why is that important? Here's some things about the book of Jonah that you need to know. First off, Jonah's a prophet. He's a messenger of God. That's his entire purpose. That's his identity. That's who he was made to be. When we read about Jonah in the Bible, we're reading about a prophet, a person whose sole job is to take the word of God to God's people, to people in general, so that they might know what the will and nature of God is. Now, in that regard, uh, just as we who follow Christ are commanded to be messengers, so Jonah's purpose has a bit to do with our purpose. That's why we can relate here. Uh, the book of Jonah takes place approximately 750 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. And that's just a couple of generations before Judah falls to the Babylonians. And that's important because in Israel's interaction with the nations around it informs their mindset. You've heard Pastor Barry speak on that before, about modern-day Israel and how they interact with the nations around them. It's completely uh, influenced by how they interact with the nations around them. At this point in history, in history excuse me, there's a nation uh, that's known as the Assyrians, and that's actually who we're talking about today. And some of you are like, well, wait a minute, I, thought, I know the story. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Yes, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. So we're talking about the Assyrians, things you need to know about them. They're not typically portrayed as the good guys here. In fact, their warfare, their culture is very violent. It's very evil. It's against what God's ways are. Uh, when we see them show up in history, and they do show up in history outside of the Bible, you should look it up. They're very aggressive and very cruel in their warfare. They don't, they don't take prisoners, okay? They, they enslave people. They move them around. They kill them. A lot of very bad atrocities that we see them do. So the conquests of Israel and Judah had a profound effect on God's people. Being in such close proximity to these people informs their experiences. What do I mean by that? At this point in history, Israel is isolationist in their existence. They do not want anything to do with any of the nations surrounding them. At this point, they've had such bad run-ins and heard such bad stories. They're like, we just want you to stay away. We're God's people. This is our promised land. You stay on your side of the fence, we'll stay on our side of the fence. Don't come near us. That's where they're at. And you can kind of understand why they feel that way. Again, if you understand the context of the nations around them, how they feel is informed by their interactions in the past. Now, again, Nineveh, capital city of the Assyrian Empire, it's about 500, 550 miles away from Galilee, okay, in Israel. Here's a map if you didn't know what that looks like. So 550 miles to Nineveh. It's a hop, skip, and a jump away for Jonah. The city of Tarshish, and you're going to hear me say that and try not to lisp really bad with it this morning. The city of Tarshish is in modern-day Spain. So when you hear Tarshish, think of Spain. Now Spain, <laughs> and Tarshish in particular, is about 2,500 miles from Galilee. So you can see one of these two is a little further away. You wouldn't really say that Tarshish is on the way to Nineveh. It's not something they're like, oh, rerouting, and it takes you like, oh, I hit an exit and came back on. This is complete opposite direction. Now, that's just some basic context for you, and that's a picture of you to understand where we're at geographically. And although there's a few themes present in the book of Jonah, I love Jonah because it's a character study of the human heart. It's a character study of a couple different hearts, 
But what we're going to see this morning is several hearts on display here. We're going to see our own hearts, possibly, as we watch Jonah operate. We get to see Jonah's thoughts and his conversations with the Lord. We get to see God's response to Jonah. And we also might discover something about the nature of the Lord as well through these conversations. Now, let's start at the beginning here. This is Jonah chapter 1. I promise you I got through this in, like, perfect time. You, some of you are already like, we're going to read through an entire book of the Bible. I'm going to be here past 3. No, you're not, I promise. This is Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, why does God want Jonah to go to Nineveh? Is it just because they're super duper evil and God can't stand that? Yes. Is there a deeper purpose behind it? Absolutely. God desired to show mercy to Nineveh. Again, this city's known for its evil, its corruption, its cruelty. These people were bad news. God's people hated them. They were the kind of people who got them in all kinds of trouble. So it's not really any wonder why Jonah then reacts like this. This is Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord which sounds kind of ridiculous, right? Those of us that have grown up that know this story are like, yeah, okay, he's going to flee from the Lord. Sure, that's going to happen. But that's what Jonah was attempting to do. He was so against this idea that the Ninevites, the Assyrians, were going to get an opportunity to repent that he had to get away from the God that told him to do it. That's how repulsive the idea was to Jonah. To Jonah, they would not have deserved the chance. This wasn't a part of the assignment. Jonah's thinking probably sounded something like this. I'm not the guy that you want for this, Lord. I exist to help you bless your people. Not these people. These are not your people, God. We're your people, Israel. Give me the suburbs. Give me Jericho. Okay, I'll go do that. I'm sitting this one out. My heart's not in it. Or maybe he would have gone as far to say, I'm not called to that ministry. And here's the thing. I said this is an examination of hearts. I want to challenge you a little bit with this this morning. How many times have we used that as an excuse sometimes not to participate in something that God has said, hey, this is part of what it means to live for Jesus? Part of what it is sometimes is loving and serving people. And oftentimes when it's something that we don't have a preference towards or we don't want to do, that becomes the excuse. Well, I'm not called to that particular ministry. I see the need, but that's not my calling. I would push back on that a little bit. Your calling is to love people how Jesus loves people and to serve people how Jesus serves people. Let's move on. Jonah would have looked at God's word and read it like we're about to read it. Now, we're going to jump backwards real quick. Jonah, part of God's people, Israel, descended from Abraham, right? In Genesis 22, God makes a promise to Abraham. And Jonah would have known this. Jonah would have read this, he would have had it memorized, and in fact, we can kind of see what his mindset's going to look like if we look at Genesis 22 like this. This is how he saw the world around him. God says to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants, Jonah being one of them, will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Stop. That's how Jonah would have read this scripture. We're God's people. He's going to bless us and multiply us and give us our heart's desire. He gave us the promised land. And we're going to overtake every one of our enemies and take their cities from them. They get nothing. Goodbye. We win. That's the end of the story for Jonah. And you can kind of see he's fleeing from God because he doesn't want to go to the Ninevites because that's how he reads this scripture. God's promises are for me, not for you. That's how he reads it. Now, If we go on one verse later, this is why context is so important. If we go one verse later in that and look at what the true meaning of this scripture is, we kind of get to see God's heart on display versus Jonah's. Here it is. This is the same, same scripture. We're just adding one more verse. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. That's where Jonah stopped. Here's where God continues the thought. And through your offspring, Jonah of which being one, 
all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God's heart was to extend mercy and goodness and grace to people. To use Israel, his people, as a blessing to every other nation. Jonah's not getting that. It doesn't make sense to him. God wanted them to take possession of the cities as a way of showing that they're being blessed, that their God is powerful, that their God can be trusted. That was the purpose of them occupying their enemies' territories. It was not to vanquish them and to watch them then shuffle off into hell for the rest of eternity. It was to give them the opportunity to see the power and the grace of God. The entire purpose of of God's people was to be a blessing to other nations by showing them the God that they served. In the same way, you and I exist to be a blessing to other people to give a testimony to the God that we serve. Now I read this and I, I can't help but wonder maybe sometimes if we get caught up in our own justification so much that we lose sight of this purpose as missionaries to the lost. Somehow we get focused on what we have and who we are, but we forget about the purpose for which we have been blessed and who we are called to take that blessing to. This was God's purpose for Jonah, but he runs from it. So going back to Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, we get why Jonah following his own heart instead of God's heart caused him to run. And my chapter heading in my Bible reads, Jonah flees the presence of the Lord. And I think that's, that's probably appropriate because it, in the presence of the Lord, there can be freedom. There can be reconciliation. There can be grace. Jonah doesn't want to be in that presence if that means grace extended to somebody else that's not like him. We've got to be really careful about this. We have to look at the world around us and understand we were just like them before Jesus. So if Jonah's not going to go to Nineveh, then we probably shouldn't go there just yet either. We've got to take a, a detour in this story. Where are we going to go to then? Well, we're going to go to the first dim on the slide. We're going to go into the maelstrom. Now, what is a maelstrom? A maelstrom is a sudden, intense storm. This is not the five-minute sprinkle shower that shows up that the weather guy in Kansas City forgot to mention. It's not just a slight breeze that knocks a few leaves off the trees. This is what's on par with a hurricane in the Mediterranean Sea. This is a very intense storm. In Jonah 1, we're in verse 4 here, it says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. That's pretty important. That's pretty powerful. That's a lot of really big waves and a lot of really strong wind. All the sailors of the ship were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to help lighten the ship. That's important too because the culture around you right now as they're being tossed around are calling out to what they call their own gods. Well, this is my truth. This is my truth. This will save me. This is my hope. And they make up their own hope because they don't have one. And they're willing to just about abandon everything about what makes them God's creations in order to get hope and they don't have it. They're in a bad situation with no way out. Except for Jonah's in the boat. Except for you and I live in the world. We just don't have to be of it. We move on. Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Now the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Are you nuts, man? Get up. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. We read that the captain and the crew, they're fighting for their lives. The captain's desperately trying anything he can to save his ship and crew. And he finds Jonah asleep in the ship. And this, unfortunately, is a perfect picture of what's going on in Jonah's heart at the moment as well. There's people in desperate need of saving. There's people that need God to intervene. And instead of taking the news that God had entrusted him with to them, he's sleeping on it, not doing anything with it. You guys figure it out on your own. Jonah thought his purpose was only to relay God's messages to his people. But God already told his people their purpose. And even after hundreds of years of disobedience and the consequences of it, they were still missing the point. This is Jonah, verse 8, still chapter 1. So they ask him, tell us, Jonah, who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And from what people are you? 
And he answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them. They asked, what have you done? They already knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. They know something's not right. And just like the people around you were desperate for answers and for hope, that captain and his crew asked Jonah now, what in the world is this storm? What does it mean? Why is it all happening? How do I save myself? So Jonah answers that he serves God. Who was in control? Jonah had the knowledge that God was everywhere and in control of everything. God was trying to remind Jonah of this to get him back on track with what his mission was. He was also building a mission, or excuse me, a message of hope for Jonah to carry as well. As you're going to see as we go through this, there's, there's, this story is, a, is deep. We hear it as kids sometimes and we think, oh, it's about obedience and disobedience. And it's so much more than that. God's building a story into this interaction with Jonah that's going to be echoed 750 years later. And it's going to be echoed 2,000 years after that through us. We've got to pay attention to it. Even though Jonah had basically abandoned his calling, God was still working with him. He was trying to re-engage him in his purpose. God brought the maelstrom to Jonah as a way of showing him, hey, it's not like you can just run from me. Will you please wake up? People could die here and you seek to abandon them. Wake up and tell them who I am. Now, I mentioned earlier, Jonah is hard for me to read sometimes. And it's because I look at this and I see a lot of myself reflected in Jonah's heart. For a period of my life when I was younger, I knew God had called me to do something with my life. I knew he had called me into ministry. And I got so afraid that I was missing out on what everybody else was experiencing in my life and just not wanting to put the effort in to reach people that I ran from it for, uh, for a few years. And it wasn't until uh, later on my wife has a conversation when he says, you know, you're still called to this. I know we've gotten to, to follow Jesus and I know that this is what you were supposed to do. Why are you not doing this? And so when I read this, I feel convicted by this. I don't feel shame, but I feel conviction. And it's my prayer that you feel conviction in your heart as well from the Holy Spirit this morning that we need to evaluate ourselves. That's what the purpose of this book is, is to evaluate our hearts against God's heart. Back to the crew. So they fought the storm longer, and finally jo Jonah told them that in order to save themselves, they needed to throw him into the sea. And they did so. Jonah takes a self-sacrificial moment, says, I'm going to die to myself because being tossed from a boat into a storm, into the ocean, basically, is basically saying, I'm ready to die. I'm going to let myself go. And as soon as they did that, the storm stops. And the crew literally stopped. The scripture says that they, they stopped, they built an altar on the boat, and they worshiped God. That's pretty intense. And that's a snapshot. There's a snapshot here that's happening in this very first point, this very first iteration in the story of Jonah of what happens first. There's a, there's a wake-up call that God wants to give each and every one of us. He wants to tell us through his spirit, wake up, look around you. You cannot save yourself from this. For Jonah it's, and, and the crew here, it's this storm will kill you. For you and I, it's you're living in opposition to God. You're living in a world of sin that's against what God wants for you. Wake up, recognize the situation and allow that conviction to really take hold. You cannot save yourself. So God speaks through the maelstrom, and he says, wake up. The next part of this story comes into it. It's called the man-eater. Now, full transparency on this next section. If you watched, uh, if you were like me, like I grew up with the flannel gram. Anybody remember flannel grams from like Sunday school? It was a felt board and it had all the little Bible characters in it and they were made of felt and they would stick them up there and you'd had like Sister Ethel would be teaching. Anyway, we had that and we had the VHS tapes of Veggie Tales. okay? <laughs> oh, Veggie Tales struck a chord. All right, I know who I'm talking to now. Um, now, if you watch Veggie Tales as a kid, if you watch the Jonah movie, if your entire knowledge of the book of Jonah is based on a pop-up book, <laughs> you may have had the same misunderstanding that I had for a, for a good portion of my adult life. Veggie Tales done me wrong. But when I was younger, based on how this was portrayed to me, I'd always thought the storm and the whale were punishments. God's calling out Jonah saying, hey, you disobeyed, so now I'm going to wreck your ship and then I'm going to have a big old stinky fish eat you. I'm going to have you eaten alive. How you like that, Jonah? 
But that's not really what Scripture says at all. And it's not the accurate nature of who God is either. If we read Scripture like that, then God is a vengeful God looking to punish us for everything that we do wrong. Is God just and will he punish wrong? Yes, absolutely. Is it his desire that he does that? No. God desires to extend mercy and grace. Why would he have sent Jonah to Nineveh in the first place if he didn't? This is what verse 17 says. And I want you to, if you have your Bibles, you can highlight this. You can underline it. It's one word that changes the entire meaning of the Scripture. This is verse 17. It says, Now the Lord provided. Doesn't say condemned. It doesn't say uh, punished. It doesn't say sent out with a vengeance. It says, The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And then Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And if you're like, three days, three nights, that sounds familiar. (laughs) Yeah, it does. Shows up 750 years later. And that's not coincidence. God's showing us something before he ever showed us something. That makes sense. Now, we already discussed that the maelstrom was this wake-up call. It was a reminder of, hey, you need to recognize where you're at. When the fish swallowed Jonah, it wasn't like Jaws, right? There's not like blood everywhere, and it wasn't teeth sinking in the flesh. And my family and I just watched Pirates of the Caribbean recently, so it wasn't like the Kraken monster that's coming and destroying the ship and eating this person, and it's all graphic and stuff. It's not that. God didn't send a terrifying beast to destroy Jonah. He sent something that could could save Jonah. See, the fish wasn't punishment. It was deliverance. The giant fish was not an act of retribution. It was salvation. How many of you think you could tread water for three days and three nights and still survive? Jonah couldn't. But God made sure that he survived. He provided a plan of salvation for him. The text says in every translation that I researched that the fish swallowed him. Didn't bite him, didn't eat him. Swallowed him. He saved him from dying at sea. Saved him from drowning. And because of that, Jonah prayed. And anytime we see any character in the Bible begin to pray as a result of something God does, we should look at that for a moment because that gives us an indication of how deep God's move really affected that person. You know, you go to Psalms and you look at David and he's praying these things and you see how God really has impacted David. You go to, you go to, to see Hannah, right, in the book of 1 Samuel and you see how God has affected her because he's given her a child. You see all these prayers. You see Mary's prayer. All of them, they're all in there. Pay very close attention to the heart change that happens in response to what God has done. In this case, pay attention to the heart change that has not happened. Jonah chapter 2 says this. He's praying to the Lord. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. So far, so good. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. This sounds like something David could have written. It's sounding pretty good so far. But then we jump down into uh, verse 8. And Jonah's entire heart gets on display for us to see. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But what I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. And the rest of it goes on here. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What I want you to catch is this. It's a very me-centered prayer. He's very quick to give God a a lot of praise for saving him but he still hasn't got the idea that what he's actually there to do and that God's love and his salvation isn't just extended to him. It's extended to other people. Jonah resumes his call, but he still misses the purpose. Those who pay regard to idols will never have your love, is what it says in one of the verses. But I sacrifice to you and you save me. It's still a very me-centered heart. There's nothing wrong with recognizing how good God has been to you. But when we get to a point to where it's all about us and nothing about God's love for anyone but us, we miss out on the blessing it is to actually be able to minister to other people. Jonah's saved by God through this act of repentance. Okay? The Lord miraculously provides salvation for, to him in the form of this giant fish, this man-eater. And this point was salvation in his life, an illustration of God saving the wayward and the disobedient. Should we ever get so bold as to think, that somehow we're better than somebody outside of the church. We need to be reminded of this, that God treated Jonah when he was wayward and disobedient and with the same grace that he hopes to extend to those that don't even know him yet. We were all sinners at one point. We have all made mistakes at some point. 
The difference is accepting grace and salvation or not. So God speaks through this man-eater. And this is what he says. He says, I will save you from death. That's what the fish is. It's salvation from death. And this is part of the gospel that's being preached in Jonah through Jonah's life. The last thing we have, it's my favorite part. This is the mercy. We've seen Jonah do everything wrong. We've seen God determined to help Jonah. And although all three of the sections that we've covered so far, the beginning of his calling and why he ran, the storm, the maelstrom, the man-eater, although we see these, and we could see these as God showing mercy to Jonah, God's desire again to, be, to begin with was to give Nineveh the opportunity to know him and experience mercy. And at the same time, Jonah should be rediscovering the same things. So the Lord helps Jonah, provides for him, because his message needs a messenger. This is Jonah chapter 3. We're jumping ahead a little bit. Verse 3 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim uh, to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to get through. That's important because they're setting up, again, something for us to look at Jonah's heart with. Let's check this out. Nineveh is three days travel from one side to the other. Jonah was sent again to Nineveh, same as before. We read the city is huge. The job is big. That's a lot of people. Jonah's just one dude. But God clearly was with him. You don't just get into a storm magically, get saved by a fish magically, show up on the beach magically, and then make it to Nineveh magically. It's not coincidence. Secondly, I didn't know this until I studied this this time. Think about this for a second. We already said the Assyrians are bad guys, right? They're violent, they're cruel, they do all sorts of things. If God spit Jonah up on the beach to go to Nineveh, he's going to have to cross through Assyria, right? What do you think the odds of Jonah making it to Nineveh in the first place without dying or being murdered is? Moral of the story there is, hey, listen, if God's calling you to do something, don't for a minute think that he's not going with you or that he's not providing a way for you to get there. God clearly communicated to Jonah, and it was giving him safety as he went. And there's no guarantee that the Ninevites are going to hear this and do anything with it. A lot of times I think you and I probably get into a situation to where we're like, you know, I would share more about Jesus with people if I felt like they were more receptive to it. Can I liberate you from something this morning? The Bible already did it, but I want to remind you of this, is that you're not responsible for other people's hearts. You're responsible to share the gospel that could change their heart. You're responsible to share the love of God through your life and through your words. If you're like, I'm just waiting until they love me enough to love Jesus, that's not going to work. Love them enough to share Jesus with them and let God take care of the heart. We stop doing this so often because we're afraid that we're going to get rejected. Accept the fact that they may not accept what you have to say. Plant the seed and move. That's what's being asked of Jonah here. Now, how do I know that we're supposed to do that? Easy. One of my favorite verses, the youth in, the, in this church know it very well. It's Matthew, my favorite book of the Bible. We're going to jump forward 750 years. I want to look at this real quick. This is the calling that each and every one of us has on us. As we look at Jonah, we can say, well, that's not how I want to accomplish this. This is what we're called to do. Matthew 28, 18 says this, Then Jesus came to them, the disciples, and said, All authority, not just some, not a little bit, all of it, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus. With that authority, I'm sending you. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded to you. The commission that Jesus gives us as his followers, as his disciples, is not really that different than the commandment that God gave to Jonah. Go to this city. Tell them they're wrong. I have the authority. They're going to have to repent. When they repent, they'll begin to know me, and their lives will change. It's not that different from what Jesus said. In fact, I would argue it's the exact same message <laughs> just before Jesus shows up on the scene. And this is the, the mission and the message that we're supposed to carry. Let's jump back into Jonah. This is chapter 3. Now Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. How many days did we say it took to get across Nineveh? Three. How do we know that Jonah's heart's still not right? He didn't even bother to go across the city. He didn't travel the back roads. He didn't go to the very center of it. He didn't find the highest place to shout it out. He went as minimal a distance as he could into the city and proclaimed it there. 
God, I'm going to do this because you saved me with a whale and you got me out of the storm. I'll do this, but I'm not going to give my all into this. This is not getting 100%. He goes in a day, stops. Hey, you've got 40 days to get your act together or God's going to blow you up. And then he leaves. That should kind of alarm us a little bit. Is that what we want for people? Is that what we want for the world around us? Do we want the world around us to go down in flames without any adequate preparation for it, without ever being told, look, my life changed. I had a storm around me just like you had it. I woke up, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I accepted Jesus, I was saved, and then I was brought into purpose and mercy and righteousness. Is, as we do that, how many people do we want to know that? Do you want people to know that? I do. Here's what happened next, verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. Notice it doesn't say they believed Jonah. They believed God. I told you, it's not our responsibility to turn the heart. God does that work. It's your responsibility to share the message. They believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Why is sackcloth important? Some of you have read this before and be like, I don't even know what that's about. It's like potato sacks? I'm like, yeah, it's like that. Here's what it means. Take off all the things you have that would show your status and adopt the status of dirt. That's about what it means. Put on the least expensive thing that you possibly have. And it even says here later on that the king himself put on sackcloth and laid down and put dust on himself. I am lower than the dirt that the animals step in. That's the position that the Ninevites took in the presence of God. And it's the right position if you're going to ask for forgiveness. When Jonah's warning reached the king, this is the part I was talking about, he rose from his throne. How many of you guys have ever heard news before and like jumped out of your seat? Like that's amazing. Uh, don't even shake your heads like you haven't done it. I've watched you watch the Chiefs on TV before. When you hear something that crazy, that good, that terrifying, you get up on out of your seat and you do something about it. That's what's happening here. The king rose from his throne, took off his robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And then he issued this procl- proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, this is how much they wanted to make sure. This is the level of repentance. Don't let people or animals, flocks or herds, taste anything. Don't let them eat. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people, and he, we talked about sackcloth being the low of the low, right? We should do that anyway out of repentance is what he's saying. But not just the people. Find that donkey and put sackcloth on him. He's literally, find your animals. Make sure that we don't offend God in any way, shape, or form. We don't want to die. So let's take every precaution. That's the level of like, I heard the news and my life changed. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. The king says, who knows? God may yet relent. And with compassion, even the king of Nineveh, the cruelest, most aggressive, evil ruler that they could have at the time, recognize that God desired to show compassion to them. Otherwise, why would he have sent this dude here? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. In this situation, God's mercy abounded and historically, even though Nineveh does eventually fall off the map, it does happen, It's not at this time. The people there repent from their wickedness and God shows them mercy. But again, this is more than a story of mercy for Nineveh. This is a foreshadowing of the gospel later on. The story of Jonah is the story of God's intended plan of salvation for all people. And we can see this if we look at Jonah from the outside. Let's get past the obedient, disobedient part for just a moment and look at Jonah's life. Even if Jonah came to Nineveh and said nothing else about it, what had happened besides what had happened in his life in the last week, that might have been enough. Here's what happened. First, there's a wake-up call. There's a wake-up call. Jonah, who is disobedient, far away from God, has made himself the enemy of God's will and has tried to flee away from the justice of God, has encountered a wake-up call in the form of a storm. 
God has compassionately allowed the situations around him to spin up in such a violent way that Jonah and the people around him have to acknowledge it's time to do something differently. This isn't working. We've thrown the cargo off the ship. We're still going to die. We've woken the dude up downstairs. We're still going to die. We've prayed to all these false gods and tried to find this truth that just is elusive, and we're still going to die. There's a wake-up call. We have to trust that God wants people to wake up. God doesn't, we, we know from Scripture that it is not his will that any should perish. For Jonah, there's a wake-up call. Jonah gave up on trying to save himself, admitted he was wrong, and started on this path of what could happen next. The second thing is this. God provided a way to be saved. This is the giant fish. The minute that Jonah said, I, I we're in, the, we're in a mess, and there's nothing I can do except for to die to myself. Just proclaim this self dead. Throw me off into the ocean. Let me die. The minute that happens, the Lord provides salvation to him through the whale. This giant fish comes, swallows him. He's in the belly of it for three days, three nights. Kind of familiar, like Jesus spent three days, three nights in the belly of the earth. So you see there's a, there's a parallel that's happening here. The third thing is we experience mercy because of these first two things. God has every right to judge us, condemn us, send us to hell for the rest of eternity. We earned it. That's what sin does. It makes us enemies of God. Because of God's great love and because he loves us first, he allows us to be woken up. He provides a method, a person, Jesus Christ, in whom we can be saved. And then he pours out compassionate mercy and right standing with him. So much so that we read in Scripture that God, because of his great love and because of what Jesus has done, allows us to boldly approach the throne of God as if we were sons of God. As if we were daughters of God. That's the level of mercy and righteousness offered. Jonah's life becomes a testimony to what God can do for the lost, the disobedient, the wayward, and those fleeing truth. Our lives are supposed to function in the same way. But Jonah is also, like I said, it's a story of two hearts. I'm going to ask the musicians to come at this point. Where the story of Nineveh receiving mercy is a message of hope for anyone that doesn't know grace in Jesus, the story of Jonah is a warning and a chance of reflection and self-evaluation for the heart of every person that does know Jesus. Here's why. In chapter 4, we see Jonah angry that God has spared Nineveh. He's literally seething with anger to the point he asks God to just let him die so he doesn't have to watch God's mercy be poured out on his enemies. Can you imagine being so dissatisfied with the fact that God wants to forgive somebody else that you would rather die than see that person go to heaven? That's a whole level of hate. God help us if any of us feel that way. Jonah feels like they're not in the club. They don't get to be part of what we are. He does not feel like they deserve it. And even after all he's been through in this past week in his life, Jonah is still stupid to the idea that God desires to save people. He desires to show mercy. And all this pertains to the condition of his heart. He did his job grudgingly, not joyfully. He didn't delight in God's goodness, but was hopeful for destruction to the point that he asked again, God, just let me die. Jonah's not the hero of this story. When the kids' books are written and it's colorful and it's like, oh, look, that's a really pretty big whale. It looks hopeful. Oh, Jonah's heart changed. He's now obedient to the Lord. He's the hero. He's what we should be. Jonah is not the hero of this story. At the end of this book, Jonah is sitting there angry that God has done something compassionate and loving and merciful. His heart is still hardened. And in fact, because his will is so separate from the heart of God, he is in a worse position than the Ninevites that have just proclaimed repentance and devotion to God's will. God was always the hero of the story. And he desired to pour out his goodness through Jonah 
so that others might be blessed. In the same way, you're not the hero of your story. Jesus is the hero of your story. And Jesus desires that his words and his love and his salvation is poured out in you, but through you so that other people can know. God desires to bless, to provide deliverance, to offer mercy and to offer purpose. I want to show you two things as we wrap this right now. I want to show you God's heart and I want to show you Jonah's heart. And as we evaluate our own hearts, as we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to point out anything in us that is not of God, use this as the criteria in which we evaluate it. Let's look at God's heart. God's heart is a desire to bless. He desires people to be in relationship with him. He wants them to experience all that he designed them to be. He desires to deliver us out of our sinful nature and out of destruction and separation from him for the rest of our eternity. He desires us to be delivered. How does he do that? He extends us mercy through Jesus so that if we can admit that we're wrong, then God can make us right. And finally, not only is he going to save you, not just to sit in a chair every week, not just to sit at home and be peaceful in the knowledge that you get to spend eternity with him, but he's given you something important to do while he's here. Why? Because he loves you and because there's more blessing in being a blessing to others than there is to just receiving it. Now Jonah's heart, on the other hand, is this. Jonah doesn't want to go where it's uncomfortable. Jonah doesn't want to leave Israel. Those are his people. They're people like him. They look like him, talk like him, smell like him. That's who he wants to be around. He wants to spend his time isolated. Because if the problems are out there, I don't want them in my life. That would make me uncomfortable. That would make me a little bit messy. Somebody told me once that sympathy is feeling bad for somebody and not doing anything for them, but empathy is getting down in the mud with people and hurting where they hurt. Jonah has no desire to hurt where people hurt. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Nineveh. Enjoy hell. It's not God's heart. He doesn't feel responsibility to anybody else, just to himself, just to his people. And it's that self-love that causes him to run from God at first and then grudgingly give others a chance at the very end. I'm asking this. There is no points to this message tonight. This is a narrative. This is a story. This is a chance to evaluate ourselves on the heart of Jonah and the heart of God. But I do have one question. If you want to take anything away from it, I want you to leave with this. We can either have the heart of God working in us Or we can have a heart like Jonah that's working against the will of God. And my question is, which heart is going to lead you? As you walk out of here and encounter people, when you go to lunch or when you go to your neighborhoods or when you go to school, your kids go to school, when you encounter people at work, which heart is going to lead you this week? Do you care? I said earlier that reading this story should prompt us with the question, what does God want me to do in response to this? He wants us to evaluate our hearts and to align our hearts with him. I'm going to ask prayer partners to come at this point. If you heard this message today and you're like, I had no idea that God was showing me that he had a plan to save me, that I was this wrong, that he's trying to wake me up. I had no idea that I need to be made right with God, that there's people literally that are here to help me walk into relationship with Jesus. If you're like, I just don't know Jesus and I need to know Jesus, I've got to get this salvation. I don't want to die then you need this this morning. And there's no special incantation. It's not, a, it's not a specific prayer that you need to pray. It's not memorized words. But your heart needs to be in line with God's heart. You need to recognize it's time for me to, to, to acknowledge where I'm at. I'm in a storm. I can't save myself. It's time for you to accept that God wants to save you through Jesus. And it's time to experience blessing and mercy. It's time. So we're going to pray, and after this, you can come up and get prayer from, from these, uh, these individuals that are up here. Would you join me? Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that it's truth, that it's applicable for all things, for, for correcting, for rebuking, for encouraging, for teaching, Lord. It builds us up. It makes us into who you designed us to be. Lord, I pray right now for everyone in the sound of my voice right now that if there's anyone that doesn't know salvation in Jesus Christ, in their life, Lord, that you would begin to pound at the door of their heart Holy Spirit right now, that they would recognize the storm that they're in. God, that they would wake up to it and accept Jesus this morning. 
God, I pray right now that you would pour out abundantly your blessing and your promise and your purpose on them. For every heart, for every person that's in this room this morning, God, I pray right now that they would be reinvigorated with a sense of purpose and a passion to see those that are lost be found by you, Jesus. I pray right now that you would encourage them, Lord, to to step out of comfortable places. God, you've not called us to easy living, but God, to purposeful life. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would encourage us, build us up from the inside, give us courage to speak truth, give us compassion to love others. God, I pray your blessing and favor uh, over all of them as they go today. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come if you need prayer. God bless you. Seek your faith.